The Kia Stinger has weird aerodynamics, but it's in a good way. So most sedans will typically produce lift, not downforce. For example, on this chart, you can see that only performance cars really produce downforce. But we simulated the Kia Stinger's aerodynamics and it produced about 20 kilos of downforce, way more than any other car in its category, including the Infiniti Q50 and even the Audi TT RS. And sure, this simulation was done at 161 kph, which is more than double the typical speed we simulate the cars at. But even factoring the difference in and moving it down to 72 kph, the Kia would produce around about 4 kilos of downforce still. And things get even weirder when we look at its general shape. So looking at the Kia Stinger's shape from the side, it looks like a wing. Its roof is very curved, its underbody is flat, so naturally, that should result in producing lift, not downforce. In this video, we'll look at why it doesn't produce lift, but we'll also look at its drag coefficient because that tells us how slippery the car is and the results also are quite surprising. And one of your amigos, Dylan, commissioned us to simulate his car for him. If you'd like us to do the very same thing for you, let us know here. Now the first thing I want to look at is the wake in this plane. That's because this plane is the center plane, slicing right down the middle of the car, and it also shows the velocity in meters per second. The little lines show the flow's direction. And the wake's direction is important because that tells us a lot about whether the car is producing lift or downforce. In fact, you can use this indicator for any object really. So for example, if the flow is shooting downwards, that indicates that lift is produced. If the flow shoots upwards, then that indicates a downforce is produced. Here, looking at the wake over time, it flaps up and down. So some of the time it suggests that lift is produced, and some of the time it suggests that downforce is produced. So this is a good first indicator that downforce might be produced. The fact that sometimes the flow flows up tells us that maybe we will overall get downforce. But we can go further and look at the rest of the car for some more details. But for that, it's better to use the pressure plot. That's because what creates downforce or lift is actually pressure differences. If the underneath of the car has lower pressure than above, that will result in the car being sucked down to the road and that's downforce. That downforce helps the car put power down to the road so you can accelerate more. Looking at the pressure plot, which is in Pascal's, we can see how it changes quite a lot over the top. Underneath, it's quite a bit more stable. So the front part is definitely in downforce's favor. That's because first, the pressure under the car in the center plane is definitely lower than over the hood of the car. But another good thing is that there is some high pressure too over the hood as we reach the windshield. Well, we should kind of expect that because as we've seen with other cars, looking at the velocity plot, as it flows over the hood, it crashes into the windshield and has to redirect. That initial crashing makes the flow dump some of its energy into the windshield and that produces high pressure here. So it seems like the first third of the car or so is producing downforce. Moving to the roof section, so about the middle third of the car, the story changes a little. We get lower pressure over the roof than underneath the car now. That's a reversal of what we saw over the hood region. So overall, the car is being sucked up here. That's lift, not downforce. So this region is actually eating into the downforce created by the hood region. And honestly, the underbody isn't bad, it's just that the roof is producing much lower pressure. It does that because if we look at the velocity plot, the flow accelerates a lot over the front of the roof. It's the fastest here than anywhere in this plane. And the reason why it accelerates is because this is a curved surface and flow doesn't separate over it. Because it's curved, the flow naturally wants to speed up like it does over a wing. That then drops the pressure because of something called Bernoulli's equation. And actually, we get low pressure here because Kia didn't really want high drag. What I mean by that is, if you make the flow separate at the very front, then the entire roof will be in a wake. That will actually increase the pressure and possibly actually make this section produce downforce now. But with that large wake, would come very high drag too. 
So if you're comfortable with that high drag, then you could increase the pressure and drop the lift here. But there are also better ways to overcome this lift. And actually, if we move to the rear third of the car now, we see one way of doing that. As we flow down the window, the pressure starts to increase. In fact, just before the end of the car, we can even get high pressure, a little red region here. That little red region actually occurs for the same reason why we got a red region in the front, where the hood met the windshield. When the flow meets the windshield, it crashes into it. Some of its energy is then wasted and becomes high static pressure. A similar thing occurs here at the rear with the rear spoiler. So the stinger has this small lip at the back of the trunk kicked up just a little. It might not seem like much, but it does provide a little bit of resistance to the flow. And looking at the velocity plot, we can see how the flow gets kicked up a little bit. That minor hindrance is enough to push the flow back, slow it down, as we see in the velocity plot, and that creates much higher static pressure. That's why we get this small region of high pressure. And it always amazes me how something so small, like this almost negligible rear spoiler, can have a relatively large effect. And actually, in this velocity plot, we see just how slow the flow becomes. Over the rear window, there is this thick green layer that really just grows so quickly. It's partly because of the antenna, but a lot because of the rear window and spoiler. But if we compare the pressure above the car to below it, it really seems like we're getting more downforce here because the underbody is producing lower pressure overall. That helps suck the car down more. So in this plane, when we talk about downforce, this car can really be broken up into three thirds. The front, then the middle, and the rear. And the front and rear are producing downforce, while the middle is producing lift. That gives us a good understanding as to why overall, this car produces so much downforce despite its shape which would typically produce lift instead. But I want to talk about the underbody a little bit more because there's a slight nuance here that can greatly affect everything. So if we look from the front to the rear, the car seems to be slightly angled up. This angle can easily be affected by the suspension you run, for example, or even how many kegs you have in the trunk. But the reason why this angle is so important is because the entire underbody then effectively acts like a diffuser. What I mean by that is, if you look at the rear of the car, it obviously has a diffuser. And in fact, this one is quite aggressive for sedans. That is another reason why this car produces a downforce when most other cars will produce lift. And then over this diffuser region, we see that the pressure drops. That's great. That's exactly what it's supposed to do. But while this diffuser is quite obvious and where it's supposed to be, at the rear of the car, the fact that the rest of the underbody is slanted up slightly also means that it too is really just one big gentle diffuser. And looking along it, the pressure stays low as the flow continually expands. So that is a major reason why we continually get low pressure over the underbody and then downforce overall. And if you were to load the trunk up with more bootleg liquor, for example, it would actually reduce the slant angle and the downforce from it would reduce. So this region really shows just how sensitive downforce can be to things that you can control yourself. And if we jump over a half a meter to the left, we get very similar pressures with two exceptions. The first is that overall, all the pressures have kind of been toned down a little bit. For example, at the hood windshield junction, there is still high pressure and for the exact same reasons, but it's not as high. Likewise, over the top of the roof, there is still low pressure, but not as low. The reason why all these pressures are being toned down as we jump over to the left half a meter is because the flow over here isn't forced to go straight over the car. If we look at the streamline orbit, you can see how as we move to either side of the car, you can see how the streamlines blow out and even start to flow over the side windows. That tells us that while the top of the car is forcing the flow to change pressure, for example, rise in pressure at the front, the flow around the sides has another option though. It can flow away from these regions and alleviate those effects. What that tells us is that for this car, the major effects in these vertical planes occur right in the center plane and the effects become watered down as we head to their sides. That is the first difference between the pressure in this self-center plane compared to the center plane. 
The second difference between this plane at half a meter to the left and the center plane is that the diffuser is performing worse here. That's because now we're much closer to the rear wheels. And so the wakes from them are really spoiling the flow for the diffuser. So it can't produce a constant low pressure. We do see that there is low pressure, but it is very intermittent. That's to be expected though. Now the interesting thing is that the wake from the front wheels isn't too bad. The pressure underneath is still pretty good even behind the front wheels. That's pretty impressive. So overall, the main reason why this thing can produce downforce while many other sedans don't is largely because of the underbody acting like a very gentle diffuser and even the rear spoiler helping produce higher pressure over the rear wheels. Let's now move to the drag because while the Kia did very well in the downforce category, when it comes to the drag coefficient, that's a different story. So it produced a drag coefficient of 0.32, which honestly is pretty bad for a sedan. And before we go any further, I want to point out that some of this badness is because of the rims the car has. So looking closely, they are very open. That naturally produces more drag. And while closing them completely, so literally just putting a flat plate over the top, that would reduce the drag coefficient by around 20 to 25 counts and bring the drag coefficient under 0.3. There are two main reasons why that is never done for production cars. The first is brake cooling. The brakes need to be cooled for safety reasons. If you close the rims off, that dramatically reduces the brake cooling and makes the car dangerous to drive, but also fun. The second reason is because of the aesthetics. Having just flat surfaces for the rims starves the designers for their yearning to design. So for a more acceptable rim with openings for cooling, and allowing the designers to fulfill their design fantasies could drop the drag coefficient by around 0.015 compared to these rims. So maybe a fairer drag coefficient value would be around 0.31 for this Kia Stinger, but life isn't fair. So let's move on. So we now know that the rims are pretty bad, but that's not the only region creating drag here. And in fact, the Kia has some good regions and some bad regions. The first really bad region to me in the center plane is the underneath of the front, the front lip. It's probably one of the worst ones we've seen. There is quite a bit of flow separation underneath it, and that also comes with a lot of drag, as we can see in this drag orbit. This lip, when it comes to drag, is just the worst of both worlds. So there are two extremes that this front lip could take. The first is that it could literally just be a round front that blends the front face with the underbody. The second is that it could extend really far out to make a splitter plate. Actually, from a drag point of view, both of these designs can yield lower drag than this current one. That's because this lip kind of pokes out, but only a couple inches. What that does is capture some air above it and make it redirect. And from a downforce point of view, it's good, because if you look at the pressure plot, we can see very high pressure just above this little surface, which pushes the car down into the road more. But the problem is that, coming back to the velocity plot, the flow has to bend around a very sharp corner. It's not even like 90 degrees, it's more like 135 degrees. It's really extreme. As a result, the fur underneath separates and we get quite a lot of drag from it. And the reason why running the front would be better, so that it simply just blends the front face into the underbody, is because the flow wouldn't be forced to turn around as an extreme angle, nor would it be so sharp. A rounder curve is easier for the flow to flow around than a sharper curve. And the reason why extending the lip out forwards more is better, so that it creates a splitter plate, is because that would then slice through the air cleanly and reduce how much the flow has to turn around to get underneath the splitter. In fact, only the flow already in line with the splitter would go underneath. The rest would go over the top. And actually, that would also create more downforce because you have a greater surface area from the high pressure on top to push down on, and you have more for the low pressure underneath to suck down as well. So this front lip, I'd say, is pretty bad for drag, worse than most sedans, and could be improved to produce more juicy downforce. And I think it might even be worse than that because if we look underneath the rest of the car, while the wake from the front lip dies out around where the front wheels end, a very thick boundary layer forms, this green layer. While that's not directly affected by the front lip's badness, it is indirectly. That's because the weight created by the front lip wastes kinetic energy. 
So if you were to take an average of the kinetic energy of the flow entering on the body, it would be higher than the downstream because the lip has wasted some of it now. That means that as the flow progresses down the underbody, it doesn't have as much kinetic energy, and so the flow becomes slower, quicker. That flow then feeds right into the diffuser, and that means that it has less kinetic energy to work with. The less it has, the less good it can perform. It still does a good job here. We can see that it kicks the flow out pretty well overall, but it could be better if it had more kinetic energy to work with. Doing that would mean that the wake would be smaller, so less drag, and we get more downforce too. So this front lip is not ideal, but in all of this, we also saw how good the diffuser is. I think this diffuser is one of the better ones going around, and I'd really like to talk about more good regions about this car, but unfortunately, there aren't that many. So let's continue with the bad, and if we come across another good one, we'll talk about that too. So anyway, looking at the drag orbit, another region that really stands out to me is the front side bends. They have these little plates just sticking out. They're there to help capture the flow and funnel it through to the side vents. And if we look at this plane 0.4 meters to the ground, they do do that to some extent, but it comes with a heavy price. You can see that on the outsides of the side vents, the flow is separating. That's what's causing this drag. That's to be expected given how sharp these plates are, and they are angled to help the flow move around them more, but it's not great still. A good way around this would be to round the outsides a little more. That curve helps the flow stay attached around these sides. So while this does look good, it's bad for drag. Another interesting region is just on the sides where the hood meets the windshield, and then the side mirrors. So while these are two distinct regions, if you look at the streamlines, they are connected aerodynamically. What is happening is that the flow over the outer edges of the top of the car travels over the hood, its high speed flow, as we can see by its redness, it then migrates outwards, and as it hits the windshield, it really redirects a lot. At this point, we can see that it has changed from red to yellow, so it has lost quite a lot of kinetic energy. And the drag orbit shows that there's quite a bit of drag forming in this region. But yellow is still faster than free stream flow, it's around 45 meters per second still. And then this flow hits the side mirrors. The drag orbit shows how much drag comes from these mirrors now. So these two regions are very connected and produce a decent amount of drag. These simulations were done with OpenFoam and PowerView. If you want to learn them, then check out our courses here. Now, the front wheel drag is quite interesting. So we get the familiar high drag regions from the bottom and top. We'll cover why we get them in a sec. But first, the weird thing that stands out to me is that we get quite high drag around the middle of the wheel too. That's pretty rare. Usually the drag here is a little lower. And there are a couple of reasons why we are getting higher drag here than expected. The first is the side vent catcher. Drag forms around there, but also awake. That then flows over the wheel around this height and means we get chaotic flow hitting the tire. That then helps create another wake and more drag. So I think this side vent panel is just a menace to society. As for the other two main drag regions over the wheel, the top and bottom, we get the bottom drag region because we have all this flow at the front hitting the wheel. That then spews out the sides and creates a wake and drag. That is very common. For the top drag region, if we look at this plane, which is 0.6 meters off the ground, we can see that a large wake forms around the top of the wheel. It seems to form partly because the wheel housing is flared a little, but also because there is flow inside the wheelhouse that wants to get out. This combination then creates a large wake and more drag. A couple of ways to fix this would be to smooth the wheelhouse styling more and to put vents somewhere on the wheelhouse to help the flow inside get out. That would reduce the wheel's tendency to produce a wake here and drag. But looking at the rear wheels, wait, do my eyes deceive me? No, the drag here is impressively low. We still get the main drag regions around the bottom and top of the wheel, but they are very small. That's really good. In fact, the top drag could be reduced even more by vents at the rear of the wheelhouse to help funnel the flow out into the wake there. And with that, we end the aerodynamics of this stinger on a good note. If you're staying on YouTube, it thinks you like this video, so check it out. 
Peace out, amigos.